咧係開呢一個。We have a quorum. I call the meeting to order. This is the panel on food safety and environmental hygiene. First of all, let's confirm the minutes of meeting. On the ninth of May,、um, there was a panel meeting. Minutes have been given to members, and we have not received any proposals for amendments. I ask members to confirm. Thank you. Information papers issued since the last meeting. There is one. Is from the administration. Is that paper on the implementation progress of the major initiatives under the new agriculture policy? The panel will, as soon as possible, arrange a meeting to discuss this item. There are three discussion items. Today, one is labeling system for genetically modified food and proposal on introduction of pre-market safety assessment on genetically modified modified food items. The next one is enforcement strategy related to hawker control, and the last one is liquor licenses improvement measures on processing of applications and review of fees. Let's invite the administration representatives to come in to join us. 咁咧就誒秘書處咧 ，the secretariat. Has prepared background brief, and there is also、uh, an information paper from the administration. We have with us for this item Professor Sophia Chan, Secretary for Food and Health; Mr. Kenneth Chan, Principal Assistant Secretary. For Food and Health, and Dr. Ho Yuk Yin, controller of the Center for Food Safety. You already have the information paper. I ask the secretary to briefly take us through it. Then I ask members to ask questions. Good afternoon. Thank you. This is the first time when I attend this panel after I've taken office on the first of July. In order to protect Hong Kong's public health and to provide quality healthcare services, to ensure food safety, and、uh, on top of that, we are also responsible for、uh, promotion of、uh, development of the agricultural and fisheries sector. We, at the same time, will maintain good. Good、uh, communication with the trade. We will also talk to、uh, mainland counterparts, and we will give a swift response when there are incidents. Environmental hygiene is a very important topic. We realize that we have to enhance our cooperation and communication with all 18 districts. We need support of the entire territory. I will also maintain good liaison with. The agriculture and fisheries sector. We will put in place measures to enable sustainable development of the sector. I will also cooperate with the legal and stakeholders, and I ask our members to continue to support the work of our bureau. Now, come back to today's topic. It is the labeling system for genetically modified food and proposal on introduction of free market safety say, assessment on genetically modified food. The World Health Organization said that、uh, food available, a、uh, gene genetically modified food available in the、um, international market, has passed a safety assessment, and is not likely to present risk for human health. All food for human consumption, including genetically modified food, should、um, meet safety standards and is and should be fit for human consumption. In 2006, Center for Food Safety issued a set of guidelines on voluntary labeling of genetically modified food. To encourage the trade to adopt、uh, labeling on a voluntary basis, 
In relation to publicity and public education, we have been working uh, along this line and we talk to stakeholders. The WHO encourages its member states to put in place an assessment system. They have also provided guidelines on assessment schemes for reference. In order to enhance protection for public health, we do think that it is necessary to introduce a mandatory pre-market safety assessment scheme. Dr. Ho Yuk Yin, controller of the Center for Food Safety, would share with you um, our ideas in relation to this uh, proposed mandatory scheme. At the right time, we will conduct public consultation. Dr. Ho. I don't have anything to add. We'll be happy to answer questions then. Members who would like to ask questions, please raise your hands. We have three members. Tommy Jung, Stephen Ho and myself. We have four minutes each. Mr. Joan. Welcome, Secretary, for coming to this panel. This is the, the first time you come here in the capacity of the Secretary. I hope that uh, you will do much better than your predecessors. Otherwise, uh, my sector will suffer. Now, back to this uh, GM food, genetically modified food. There has been a lot of discussions over a long period of time here. You said in the paper that Codex don't have any guidelines. And in paragraph 14, uh, you said you intend to put in place a scheme. So you are going to draw up a list of um, food? Or is it the case that uh, if there is less than 5% uh, genetically modified content, you don't have to be notified? Or is it the case that as long as there is uh, GM content, you will have to, they will have to make an application of, to you and um, they will have and the food will have to be listed on the list before it can be sold. What standard do you adopt when you conduct testings? Uh, how are they done? Secretary, thank you. Codex actually has put down guidelines in relation to risk assessment setting out uh, risk assessment methods of genetically modified food. Currently, we have a voluntary GM food labeling scheme. We have been to the ledge goal. Some members would like us to make this scheme mandatory. And if it is mandatory, it means legislation. Drawing reference from overseas jurisdictions, they would put in place a pre-market safety assessment scheme. Because with the pre-market safety assessment, there will be more information obtained to guide us when we introduce the mandatory GM food labeling. So GM food developers, if they are to uh, put uh, make available for sale GM food in Hong Kong. They have to make an application and give us s supporting documents. The Center for Food Safety will check whether the GM food developers follow safety issues based on Codex principles and guidelines. Of course. Uh, they will also take into account a number of factors, say, for example, whether the GM food consists of 
or, or derived from GM micro organisms, plants and animals, bef um, and they must pass um, safety assessment before it can be sold in Hong Kong. So, would it cause some importers of uh, GM food because of your thinking to postpone their supply of food in Hong Kong, or also would it result in some foods not being brought into Hong Kong because they may not pass your requirement. And how long would it take for you to do the assessment? And what sort of assessment are you doing? We think that the um, pre-market pre safety assessment will be actually provided by the uh, biotech companies involved. So for the uh, retailers, distributors, there will be very limited impact on them. As for the assessment itself, uh, I'll start to hold to elaborate. Thank you, Chairman. The PMSAS, actually, uh, there has been guidelines laid down by Codex on what to cover. And the assessment will cover mainly GM food and whether it would affect human health. So therefore, the uh, PMSAS, the test would involve a large number of tests to be done by the developers. Um, food can only be produced only when the tests show that uh, there's no impact, negative impact on the health. We look at whether a product is poisonous, whether it will lead to allergy, or whether its nutritional value has been altered, or whether human health will be affected. And there could also be um, some non-expected impact because you know genetically modified food is intended to achieve cer certain purposes, but there could be um, unknown effects beforehand. So therefore, we need to do the assessment um, expected from the developers or manufacturers. I believe that for most of the GM food available in, in the international markets, the producing countries have already done their assessment, so um, we would need to see the result of the assessment done in overseas countries. And there also need to be the provision of the testing methods adopted so that our own lab can do the same laboratory tests, chemical tests on the food. And if we are pleased with the assessment results, the food can be sold here. For example, for beans, um, or the test used for soybeans, and then save a product with soybeans. But if the food itself is not approved in Hong Kong, it can't be sold. I know in Hong Kong, lots of GM food is being sold. So we will have a transitional arrangement. That is, once the scheme is launched, we will discuss with the sector the transitional arrangements for food that's already on sale here, they will be continued, but they will need to apply for approval. So, Chairman, for overseas countries that have given approval for the food, would, it, would, not, would Hong Kong just accept that, or will Hong Kong uh, require the manufacturers to go through our own test? Yet they will need to make an application still, because if they don't apply, we can't test the products. They will need to. The providers of the food would need to provide us with the testing methods. Chairman, let me supplement. Okay, the issue pointed out by Mr. Jung, in, in, the, in the scenario, the cases mentioned by Mr. Jung, the procedures involved will be simple. Next one is Ho Chen In. My question is similar to what Mr. Jung, Tommy Jung, just asked. Just then, the government was saying that in Hong Kong, you need to apply, and if you have got approved overseas, you have to show Hong Kong authorities the document and, and see what the content of the overseas assessment is. So it's like making an application to the Hong Kong government. But would you have the ability to test the components of the GM food? The components, test for the components and the impact and so forth. If not, then it will be the same as other food safety regulations. That is, as long as the food is not dangerous, then you would let it be sold. But what happened in Brazil is that there are some fake documents produced. So how can you assess in a way that you will have liaisons with overseas countries? 
So will the government uh, carry out safety assessment of GM food? Dr. Ho, please. For safety assessment, earlier on in the CFS, we have um, hired some overseas experts to carry out training um, so we can carry out the testing ourselves. For foods that are already approved overseas, we hope that the application procedure here will be simplified. Of course, the applicants will need to provide us with the test uh, proof of tests done overseas for safety, and we also make reference to the vetting procedures of overseas organizations, and we also make reference to the outcome of the tests. So we hope that in Hong Kong, the overall approval process will be simplified. Chairman, I'm not talking about whether it's complicated or not, the process itself, but the uh, process of GM food now being sold in Hong Kong is fine for you to simplify the procedures to let them be sold. But now you have a new regime. Then would you go back and test foods that have been sold in Hong Kong? If you think that if you have assessed all the uh, processed GM foods in Hong Kong that they're safe, then, then, then there's no need for this new system. So if you find out from a test that there's a problem with food, then what would you do? And can you really have the ability to test for safety of the food? Let me supplement right now because uh, we've got a voluntary labeling scheme in place already. So in our laboratories, we are able to, under the voluntary scheme, uh, we can carry out safety tests. So that's already available. But for the pre Market safety assessment scheme. Once we have done the public consultation, if the um, testing labs is find out that they need to get more testing ability services or to be able to handle greater quantities of food, then we will be prepared for that. And another layer of um, area that we test is our. Uh, that is a um, regular food safety scheme, which covers 65,000 samples every year, which cover actually at the level of retail and importation re and wholesale, we do cover GM and non-GM food in, under that scheme. If there are any problems found, we will announce it to the public. But they are general foods, but they include JM food, GM food. Okay. In paragraph 11 of the paper, you said that in 2013, um, there is a joint study and uh, you provided guidelines. And over 5% of GM materials actually um, were found in five samples, and yet they did not carry GM food labels. So you might want to legislate so that if there is in excess of 5% of GM materials, you may, in accordance with the law, to provide or impose penalties. So. If you were to launch that sort of regulation, can that really have an impact at all? Dr. Ho, we're talking about two systems. One is the labeling itself, and the other is the pre-market safety assessment. CFS or government laboratories have the capability to carry out testing. But how can you make sure that all the approved GM food in the future can be tested by government laboratories. It will depend on the manufacturers provide with our um, laboratories the testing methods. So in the future, all GM food sold in Hong Kong, all the components uh, will be to make sure that they can be checked by our laboratory. If we found that there are components in the GM food that have not been approved and yet are on sale here, then that would be against the law. Another system is that is the labeling system. If you have GM food components there, then you should must have a labeling attached. But the current voluntary system doesn't mention whether the GM components are pre-market approved or not. But they are components that have been proven to be safe in overseas countries. Okay, my turn now. 
all along we've been having a voluntary labeling scheme, and the government has no intention to make it mandatory. So the government now hopes that above the voluntary system there is this. Safety assessment scheme before the food is sold, but the problem is, firstly, if you don't have a mandatory labeling system, why do they have to tell you whether they have GM food or not? And if they tell you that it's GM, then they need to go for the safety assessment proof. So if they are not required to tell you where they have GM food, so how can you ensure that at the import level? They will provide the、um, safety approvals.、So、there's some kind of illogical、um, thinking here, and you're saying that you talk about developers, the developers, to provide the safety proof, but the importers, wholesalers, and the retailers don't they sh shouldn't they be held responsible? You know, there's so much GM food now in the market. Is it that you can't do anything about what's already available here? How can you operate the scheme itself, Doctor Ho? Can you elaborate more on it, Doctor Ho, Mr. Chairman? The PMSAS in question is such that later, if you want to import some GM components into Hong Kong. Once the scheme is in place, you must have approval for them, and you can only sell them once we have given you the approval. If you found any of the GM food with components、um, which are not approved beforehand, then that would be illegal. We would collect random samples from the market, and if we find there's any unapproved GM food, then that would constitute an offence. So、it's not just the develop manufacturers, but the people selling the food will also be held legally liable. But if they don't have the labeling, how can you do the uh, random uh, random testing? Well, we don't need to see the label. We just take random samples. We know which kinds of foods have a high chance of having GM components, and that would be the basis of our random collection of samples. Once we have carry out tests on the Samples, and we will see whether the GM components are on a list, approved list. If it's not on a approved list, that would be an an offence. So the food, GM food import importers, what is their responsibility? The importers must ensure that the food that they're selling should it contain GM components. Then the components should be on our approved list. 咁而我。When we have the system put in place, all GM substance、um, approved will be uploaded on the website. On the list, will you also contain the name of the GM developer and the crop developed in a specific farm? How exhaustive is your list? Well, it will contain list of the developer. What kind of food it is? Say, for example,、um, soya bean.、Uh, which part of it has gone through genetic genetic modification? Soya bean can be used in many different types of food. So, importers, sellers, retailers, distributors will have to ensure that the food they sell. Will only contain approved GM substance. So wholesalers, importers, distributors will have to provide a certificate, not a certificate, but they have to put. They have to take steps to talk to the importer to ensure that the food sold will、uh, is approved here. It mentioned here that government laboratories will have the capacity to verify whether a GM food is safe or not.
Can you give us information about the items that uh, you have the capacity to test and the meth and the method of testing? Yes, I will ask uh, the government of laboratory to give the information. So far, they uh, they have the capacity to test for dozens of uh, items, and in the market there are about ninety of them. So there is still a gap. When we have the system put in place, they will need to enhance their uh, capacity. Ms. Tanya Chen, sorry, I'm a bit confused. You said uh, there is a pre-market safety assessment scheme. S some food has already gone through testing in their place of origin, and you require um the parties to provide you with the um testing method you will also ask for the test result right yes and i see that the cfs will drop a list and upload it on the website for the reference of public and the trade so what is the uh, responsibility of cfs you will not include on the list food that has not been tested. Do you bear any legal legal responsibility? Or is it the case that, um, well, it's for your reference and we are not to be held responsible? Thank you, Ms. Chan, for the question. We're talking about two systems. First is the voluntary labeling system. We have done some tests. Uh, and found that most of the items have passed, but we have heard voices asking for a mandatory labeling system. For that, we need legislation. And drawing reference from other jurisdictions prior to legislation, there needs to be a pre-market assessment scheme to give us information to prove safety Say, for example, we need to obtain information about test methods and proof. With the information, it will give us more information. I will defer to Dr. Ho for the list. The list contained approved GM food. As I said, it will set out the name of the developer and the um, GM content. Currently, um, there are corn, uh, um, and also soya bean that go through that usually will go through GM. Some pesticides may have undergone genetically modifi genetic modification as well. And that is for the reference of the trade. I do think that the public will need more information. Apart from the list, and I think you need to give uh, more information about uh, w well, uh, what process of the food involves a genetic modification. You said that there are about 90 items that have gone through genetic modification. However, you only have the capacity to test for about dozens of them. So what are they? What's um, harmful? What is not harmful? You also mentioned about rapeseed being usually genetically modified. So I want to know um, what 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 are harmful to human health? When we talk about GM food, we talk about uh, 
raw material ingredient. Most common items are corn and soy bean. There are many different types. Um, melon, apple, papaya, pears, potatoes, and tomatoes. About a dozen or so of GM food. And there are about uh, there are over ninety different types of food available in the market, maybe twenty or thirty for just soybean and corn alone. You ask uh, for the uh, list of items that you can test for, and what are the uh, GM food available in the market. And if it is already on that list, does it mean that the they don't have to give you any certification? We can only compile the list after we have given approval. On our website, there is information available about what's currently available in the international market. Not all of them would like to enter the Hong Kong market. If they want to, in the future, they will have to go through an approval system. Next, Mr. Leung Yu Chung. A number of members have asked about this. Paragraph 14, for reference of the public and the trade. And I want to know, what do you mean, for reference? That means the public and the trade will bear responsibility in the end. Is for reference only, or you ensure that this GM food is safe? And it's just for your information only. Is that is that the case? Consumers may not know that much. They may not know much about um, the effects of genetically modified food. As you said, that it may be modified in a way so that it will be, it will better resist pests. And we don't know. Yes, it may be resistant to a certain type of pest or pesticide. What effect will they have on human beings? And if you compile a list of approved items, then we will believe you that uh, these are safe. Or is it the case that it's only for your reference, and uh, you can't, you will have to exercise judgment on your own? So who will bear responsibility in the end? Thank you. Let me give you some information about the overall situation and then Dr. Ho will give you more information about the term for reference. So, whether it's for reference or not is not important. Is it the case that uh, you bear your own responsibility? What do you mean? Health? Yes. Yes. If you buy it, uh, you will bear the responsibility of whether it will be harmful to your health or not. You will bear the responsibility of your health suffering because it's only for your reference. Thank you. In Hong Kong, we already have laws to ensure that all food for um, Human consumption should be fit for human consumption. We just want to add some more to it, some additional measures. We would like to conduct risk assessment before they enter the market and only allow them to enter the market when, uh, when it's approved. 
the CFS will look at supporting documents submitted to ensure that everything is in order before they are allowed to be sold in Hong Kong. For that list, well, Dr. Ho will supplement. The purpose is to give more information to the public and the trade about detailed information of uh, the food on that list. Dr. Ho. The pre-market assess safe assessment scheme is to ensure that GM food has gone through safety assessment before they are sold in Hong Kong. The developer will have to go through vigorous testing to, to test for um, toxicity and allergenicity as well as uh, certain specific uh, tests. They will have to pass all the tests and we will, we will vet their application before we give the approval. So, food that we have approved are safe for consumption. So, the, the government will bear the responsibility, not consumers, is that right? Because a lot of countries and a lot of people oppose to GM food because it can have far-reaching implications. And if you say that they're safe, then the public will believe you. So you will be held responsible. WHO has given a very clear saying that GM food available in the international market are safe for consumption and there is so far no um, evidence showing that GM food currently available is, n is not likely to present risk for human health. If that is the case, it would be superf su superfluous to ask for proof from developers that they ask the food to be sold is safe. The international market changes. That may be the case today, but will it be the same in the future? Without pre-market safety assessment, we can't rule out the possibility that um, the situation will change. WHO recommends that member states will put in place uh, schemes to ensure safety. And I think it's down to this whether um, we trust testing of the government. Next, Mr. Edward Lau. It seems that um, no one dares to say that GM food is 100% safe and there is no evidence showing that is not it's not unsafe no one can prove that is 100% safe i think the best way is to have mandatory labeling scheme to let the public know that uh, it that the food contains GM food and the consumer can make a decision themselves whether to buy the food or not. The voluntary scheme is not ideal. If the information is on the label, then I can make an informed decision. So it's better that it becomes a mandatory scheme. Currently, there is no standard to say whether it's safe or not. Uh, but an ordinary consumer may not know how to read the information on the label. Are there any ways for you to teach uh, the public how to read the information? It's not just GM food labeling. It's well for uh, the food labeling scheme. 
Not all consumers know how to read the label. Your public education effort has not been done well. Perhaps you need to enhance public education and publicity. Secretary, is it compulsory and also education? Thank you, Mr. Lau and Chairman. I think for the CFS, on the one hand, as it's been mentioned right now, if we want to have the PMSAS, actually that can ensure that GM food brought into Hong Kong are safe. The WHO also thinks that most GM food so internationally are safe, but Codex wants countries to do more, that is to have the pre-market safety assessment. And that's something that we want to put forward for public consultation. As for labeling, that is when a kind of food is available to the public. You know, the labeling scheme is voluntary, but we think that we need to do the pre-market safety assessment first to get more information so that when we have legislation on the mandatory system, we can have more information available. Okay, the PMSAS. How do you do the assessment? Because scientifically, you know, it's still controversial about all kinds of foods. And GM food do not have immediate impact. It's not like food poisoning in the case of food poisoning, right? Or Manashai Green. We all know, you know, those are harmful substances, but what can you use to assess the risk of a particular kind of GM food? So far, you know, what do we know? So to what degree of safety will you be assessing for? Okay, our initial concept is that it would be a system of assessment under which developers of GM food, should they want to sell those foods in Hong Kong, then they must make an application to CFS and also to provide documents to help with our assessment. As Dr. Ho just mentioned, he just explained what kinds of documents we're looking for. And then the Center for Food Safety will assess whether the developers of the GM food have followed the guidelines of Codex because Codex itself has various guidelines on GM foods, including how to test those foods. So we'll have to see whether the developers comply with the principles laid down by Codex. And uh, we also look at whether the foods concerns GM microorganisms, plants, or animals. All these GM components have to pass the safety test. So as Dr. Ho just said, it really requires them to make applications. As for the compulsory labeling system, we have an open attitude. We think that, however, we should do the PMSAS first so that we can have more information available to help with our setting up of a mandatory system. And a few points here about publicity and education. I agree. Mr. Lau, as Mr. Lau said, the public hope to know more about GM food. Center for Food Safety all along has carried out or um, seminars or consultation forums with the sector or actually um, distributed leaflets uploaded them on their website on GM food. Lately, they've been to schools and family service centers, elderly centers to carry out forums. Sorry, Secretary, I think you do need to give us all the details on publicity and education. You can provide them the information to us in writing because otherwise you drag on for half an hour. Okay, I think for the first round of Q&A, any other members with questions besides uh, Chen Lai Wen? If not, then Chen Lai Wen, please. You have four minutes, including the answer. Chairman, I very much hope the Secretary can say more on GM food. 
What sort of impact will it have to human health? Is it that it's all okay for consumption? Because in paragraph 13 of the paper, it says that the GM food sold in the international market have passed um, the risk assessments of food safety regulation regulatory bodies of various countries or places, and it's not likely to present risk for human health. So if that's the case, if that's the case, and now you're asking the food suppliers to indicate where their food has GM substances or not, and you want to have clear labeling, large labeling, but I think it will be difficult for you to ask them to do it. Why are there GM components in some foods? Because maybe the uh, modification is only to make improvements, like in Japan. Fruits in Japan have various shapes. Definitely, these um, fruits of various shapes have uh, genetical engineering. So, w w would it be harmful to our health to eat the big, large apples? I think if you have a rigid regulation that is requiring food suppliers to attach labels on GM, I think before you do that, you must give the public more information first, so that we all know, so that we all know that uh, you know GM food is, for example, um, not unsafe. So can you give me an answer then? Based on your safety assessment of foods sold in Hong Kong, well, I think all of the foods in Hong Kong are imported. Have you ever found any GM foods that could be potentially harmful to human health? Secretary, thank you, Chairman, and Ms. Chiang. If you, uh, I think Dr. Ho could supplement later on, but if you look at um, WHO's information on the whole all the GM foods sold internationally are safe but for Codex it actually is more precise even though the foods are on the whole safe it does hope that the member nations can carry out pre-market safety assessment to ensure that the imported GM foods have passed the um, safety standards of Codex. That was sent a clearer message to the public. So now we are putting forward this um, idea for the scheme for public consultation. As for health risks, maybe Dr. Ho could say a bit more. Yes, as I just said, WHO has commented that the GM food sold internationally right now are unlikely to present risks to human health. And over the past 20, 30 years, the GM foods sold internationally have not caused any food safety incidents. So the proposal now for PMSAS provides another layer of protection. Because there could be changes in the market in the future, if we don't have such a scheme, then we can't ensure that GM foods sold in Hong Kong in the future will comply with the safety requirements. Okay, so I'd like to ask members, does anyone have any more questions? If not, then we'll have the second round. Um, Ho Chun Yin and I myself, okay, are in the second round. Anyone else? Ms. Chiang? Okay, so each will have two minutes, and then we'll draw a line because we need to move on to the next item. Mr. Ho Chun Yin, I have a simple point to make. I hope that uh, members and secretary officials can take note that besides the risk to health, you know, GM foods could actually um, have a uh, damaging effect on other species. Like papaya, 70% of papayas now are um, genetically modified. So I hope the, the public will know. The plastic bags are very handy, but the more you use, the more plastic bags you use, the more harmful it will be to the health. So you need to look at the content of 
a GM food and see whether the g genetically modification, genetic modification could actually undermine some species. So please provide us with more information, Secretary. Yes, for the impact on the environment, the um, fishery and agriculture and fishery conservation department would, of course. And the Environment Bureau would um, pay attention to that. But Mr. Ho, if you want more information on the impact on the environment and other species, we'll see uh, what the Agriculture and Conservation Department can do. Okay, the Democratic Party very much supports the government's intention to set up um, safety assessment regulatory regime. For GM foods, and we think that it shouldn't be a voluntary regime, because when it comes to regulation, the government should be able to enforce it and have uh, legal powers. If it's all voluntary in nature, then you can't really enforce a regulatory regime. So the uh, GM food labeling system and the PMSAS for GM food, I think both should be carried out in parallel. So I hope that the government can have the will to legislate on regulation and give us a timetable when you will have the consultation paper prepared and come to a brief logical secretary. I think our thinking is that we do hope to have a, a proper regulatory system. Therefore, first of all, we will put forward the PMSAS for public consultation. First, and Chairman, as you just said, the mandatory labeling system, we are open about that. So we'll see um, when the time comes for public consultation, we'll see what the public opinions are like. As for the timetable, we need to have the public consultation first, of course. We'll do it, we'll try to do it ASAP. And we'll get the papers ready for consultation. And after the consultation, we will try to move in the direction of uh, setting up a regulatory system. So I hope that the government can prepare the paper SAP and come back to that code in the next large code term. So the last one is Chen Lai Wen, two minutes. You're the last one. Thank you, Chairman. DAB also supports for all prepackaged. You mean prepackaged GM food? Or all prepackaged to it. Well, we support labeling system for them. That is the prepackaged GM food. But we also think that you can carry out the uh, regulation in phases or gradually, because if you think more deeply, there isn't really a big problems here. You know what we eat. Actually, most of it is GM. In nature, even when you go into a supermarket, actually in, in the end, what you will see is GM labeling everywhere in the supermarket. Well, that would be very sad, according to Ho Chung Yin, what she has said. So please don't interrupt me. Give me half a minute back, please. So I think that why don't we do some statistics first? How many more? How many quantities? Or how much is there in Hong Kong GM food? Better than to have you know doubts, much public doubts about the, uh, that it could be a huge amount of gym foods here. Secretary, if you're not, if you're carrying out a labeling system, I mean, the public do have a right to know. So they be hopes that you know, the secretary, you see what I'm saying. In the market, say if ninety percent of the foods are already GM in nature, then that that could be it. Thank you, Miss Chang. As I said. The government is determined to set up a regulatory control of GM food here in Hong Kong. Currently, we have a voluntary labeling system. On top of that, we would like to put in place a pre-market safety assessment scheme we will conduct public education as soon as possible. We keep an open mind when it comes to mandatory labeling scheme. That's the end of the discussion of this item. The administration will give us supplementary information paper. Next item.
I see a lot of hands already. It's about enforcement strategy relating to hawker control. I ask the Secretariat to invite government representatives to to come in to join us. I thank the Secretary and the two government officials for attending the last item. I see that members have raised their hands to indicate that they would like to ask questions. We have Ms. Tanya Chan, Mr. Edward Lau, Mr. Jeremy Tam, Ms. Starry Lee, Ms. Lau Siu Lai, Mr. Roy Kwong, Mr. Leung Yu Chung, and myself. Anyone else? Have I missed anyone? Ms. Claudia Mo. I'll let you go before I do. I will be the last one. Have I missed out anyone? Ms. Chen, you would like to swap places with Mr. Jeremy Tam. So the first one is Mr. Jeremy Tam. I'd like to welcome government officials. We have Director of Food and Environmental Hygiene, Ms. Vivian Lau. Principal Assistant Secretary for Food and Health, Ms. Diane Wong, and Assistant Director, Food and Environmental Hygiene Department, Mr. Lam Wing Hong. I received from Mr. Xiu Ka Chun a letter. He is not here, but he has asked some questions. The letter has been given to the administration. I ask the administration to give Mr. Xu a written reply copied to us. Now, I give the floor to the director of the FEHD to take us through the paper. Thank you. Let me briefly present the information paper on enforcement strategy relating to hawker control and challenges faced by us in law enforcement. As you know that um, street hawking has a long history in Hong Kong. The challenges we face every day is that are the different views from the community. We have received a lot of complaints in the past three years in relation to illegal hawking and obstruction in public places. We have received on average 13,500 complaints a year. Complainants were mainly dissatisfied with street obstruction, noise and environmental hygiene problems, and they demanded enforcement actions. On the other hand, there are opinions that uh, discretion should be exercised when it comes to street hawking, especially in cases involving aged and disabled hawkers. Because of the difference in opinions, our frontline officers in their law enforcement uh, action face a lot of challenges. We would like to stri strike a balance between allowing legal hawking activities and maintaining environmental hygiene, safeguarding food safety, ensuring public safety and protecting the public from nuisance. When it comes to hawker management strategy, there are two major areas. Usually we will take enforcement action without prior warning in that when it involves a sale of prohibited or restricted food or cooked food, or the hawking takes place in major thoroughfares or areas of high pedestrian flow. So in these two scenarios, um, law enforcement action will be taken without prior warning. However, 
if it's not one of the two, we will first give verbal warning before taking enforcement action. And if the verbal warning is unheeded, then we would uh, consider prosecution. And it's for the court to decide how to penalize the culprit. We would like to um, emphasize that hawker management is not assessed on the basis of number of prosecutions. In cases where aged or disabled hawkers are involved, uh, staff members will exercise their power in a reasonable manner having regard to the circumstances. Usually we'll ask them to disperse, and if they refuse to comply, we'll give verbal warning. If that is unheeded, then we will initiate a prosecution. When we take enforcement actions against illegal street hawking, the most tricky part is uh, to do our job well while being reasonable. Usually, we do not tolerate uh, unlicensed hawkers. We have the responsibility of enforcing the law. Well, when discretion is exercised, we have to bear in mind whether it will give rise to misunderstanding of selective or unfair enforcement or even suspected act of harboring. Our law enforcement actions are taken on a non-discriminatory basis. No one is granted immunity. In relation to people who repeatedly ignore our warnings, if we continue to just give them verbal warnings, we will um, be criticized for uh, being lackluster in our enforcement action, and it will send out a wrong message that um, the interest of some people will override the right of public to use the streets. Well, we would we will uh, conduct review to improve our operational guidelines to make sure that they will be clearer. Um, what is the? They will cover definition of um, what is meant by um, unheeded, repeated warnings, evidence con collection, pr prosecution, priority. We will ensure that our duties are carried out with both reasonableness and sensitivity, and we'll remind our frontline staff and that, and we will provide them with sufficient training. There are nine members who would like to ask questions. If members would like to ask questions, please come down and give an indication as po soon as possible. And Mr. Long Kwa Hong as well. We have Jeremy Tam. Edward Lau, Tanya Chan, Sari Lee, La Siu Lai, Roy Kong, Yung Yu Chong, Claudia Mo, myself, and Lung Kwa Kong. We may not have second round. We may not have time, so most likely we won't have a second round. Three minutes each, question and answers included. Mr. Tan. Page 2, paragraph 5, in the last line, it says the FHD's guideline clearly states that hawker management is not assessed on the basis of number of prosecutions. So I'd like to ask, does it mean that uh, there is no culture of um, having to come up with a, a number of, certain number of uh, prosecution cases? In short, well, there is no such uh, situation when people have to come up with a certain number of cases. I have with me a staff union from the FEHD dated the 7th of July to you. In the second paragraph, it says that uh, in recent times uh, we have received a lot of uh, um, cases that frontline officers have been put under tremendous pressure to come up with a large number of prosecution numbers. Uh, the investigation unit is the hardest hit unit. As far as we know that uh, the supervisors of these frontline officers are also faced with pressure from their superior to come up with a certain number of prosecution cases. 
If that is the case, why would the staff union send you this letter dated the 7th of July? As I said, that internally we don't have a, f a quota that the officers will have to meet. When it comes to prosecution cases in the past three years, in 2014, uh, it stood at for 26,000, uh, 2014, uh, 23,000, and 2016, 15,000. No need to give me the figures. Uh, there is another document. This is an appraisal of assistant uh, hawker control officer. There are four items. What is meant by uh, meeting the quota and what the quota is. There are four tiers. Tier one, uh, four points for pros for arrests, and then it summons, and then um, fixed penalty tickets and seizure. Seizure comes with the lowest score, and if they want a promotion, they have to be assessed on this, and it's done in each district and it's given to the sec secretary of each district. And if you don't call this a quota, what is? I have made it very clear. I can read out internal code of uh, Hawker control. So answer me first. Is there this form of appraisal? Mr. Tan, let the director answer. You ask if we have um, this kind of uh, quota that has to be met. So I would like to seriously clarify that when it comes to Hawker um, control action, the code, i read it out. The number of street hawkers is the, um, is the criteria of assessing actions to be taken, and the number of prosecutions does not reflect the effectiveness of our enforcement actions. It is not an indicator of the effectiveness of our action. However, whether you get promoted or not depends on this. May I explain the uh, criteria adopted in the promotion exercise. So what about what Mr. Tam said? Is it true or not? May I finish? Number of prosecution is not assessed on the number of prosecutions. Well, when it comes to promotions, according to the civil service regulations, we follow the established procedure and its uh, criteria. We assess the capability um, and capacity of the officers and um, character and experience. Let me say this again. We have not uh, set down the number of quotas of prosecution cases for frontline officers. Perhaps, uh, Director, you will have to look into whether there is such a thing in the operational level. Mr. Edward Lau, it says that the FEHD will review current operational guidelines, including to improve clarity. I'm very concerned about this because when a mistake is made, they will say that they would, um, as they would strengthen guideline. That means more workload. Frontline officers will follow guidelines to the letter. I think what is lacking is common sense. Just now, the director asked, uh, talked about uh, misconception of harboring. Well, if there's an old hawker uh, selling, and if there are no complaints, I would not think that is uh, there is any harboring. However, if there is a syndicate operating and you don't take any action, then I get the sense that there is harboring. Well, I think um, the public will decide whether it whether the activities affect them. Can you tell me? This is a licensed hawker, a licensed itinerant hawker. 
the length of the trolley is, well, the area he operates is from me to Mr. Leung Yu Chong and it's quite wide. It's a licensed hawker. So, you, and because it's licensed, you don't take any action. Every day, residents complain. And you said, well, he's got a license. God. So that shows how rigid the guidelines are. I think if you have too many guidelines and staff can say they will follow them, and that would like be like a shield to them. I think every H D, whether in internal training or civil service training, as Mrs. Lam said, looking to the future, there should be simplified procedures for civil servants. You really need to um, pay more attention to common sense and be sensitive to people's sentiments. Say, you know, you, if you are on the street and see um, someone hawker who's not really causing a nuisance, and if you look at a number of complaints against the store, if someone complains a hundred times, that means a hundred people complaining against a store. And you will know what to do. You can't just rigidly follow guidelines. So I'd like to ask you for licensed um, people there in the picture. What would you do? I think you are talking about licensed Algerian hawkers. You may recall that in the night since the nineteen nineties, during the era of the Urban Council, Algerian. Hawkers were seen as causing much nuisance to the community. Therefore, new measures were adopted. That is, an uh, extra payment were offered to get back their licenses. And many years have passed since then. Now, a licensed Algerian uh, hawker nowadays there are not more than five hundred of them. It is an issue of legacy. But is it because they have? licenses, then they can just um, set up their stores anywhere? Well, I think under two circumstances under which we will initiate prosecutions. One scenario is if the hawker causes nuisance and actual obstruction on the street, say, for example, it's more than a cart. You, the you, hawkers used to push a cart to sell their wares, right? But if there are any extensions to the carts that occupy, say, an area of 20 meters, 10 meters, then under that circumstance, we can sue them for obstruction on the street. But you haven't taken note of some loopholes, for example, assistance or a store expanding from 10 feet to 20, 30 feet, or one store being extended to 10 stores. You know, there are all sorts of other stores, you know, um, scattered around a hawker store. Yes, Mr. Lau, if you have uh, specific cases, you can pass the information to the director. I think you can just find this um, situation in various areas. You can just go and have a look for yourself. Next one, Tanya Chan. I agree with Mr. Lau Kuo Fan that it's so common, you know, what you've seen on the picture. It's like there is selective enforcement now. You just issue a verbal warning but to a hawker, but after the H F E H D staff are gone, then the same store will come back again or hawkers will come back to the site again. I'm not saying not stores putting their wares on the out on the street on the pavement. A summary of performance appraisal of H um A H C O's that means assistant cultural and co assistance. You can see from this document the summary. Do you know of this document, director? As I just mentioned, any uh, number of prosecutions against hawkers will not be used to um, do the staff appraisal. I just want to know whether she knows of the existence of such documents. So you can tell me that this is real, right? If it's not real, then I would throw it away. Director, have you seen such a document? You haven't seen this form. Does it mean that this is fake? Maybe I'll give you this, pass it to you to, to let you take a look at it. I wouldn't be rude to the director, of course, in the meantime, but I'll ask the steward to uh, hand over this document to the director. 
On this exact form, there is a column on performance figures. That is uh, like what Jeremy Tam said. They have to put in the um, figures on this form and then calculate a total score. For example, arrest a worth four scores, summons worth three scores, and then seizure worth one score or one point. So this is a, the scores obtained will be input on the summary of appraisal performance for appraisal. Is it that you've forgotten about such document, or do you don't care? You don't care about this document at all. If you intend to pretend to be sleeping, that can't wake you up. But we have received a copy of this document. It's not given to us by the union, but we did receive this form. So, are you saying that that this form is fake? It never existed. I'll give you time. I'll give the director time to verify whether this form itself is true or not. I'll wait for you to ascertain whether it's true or not. And is this form used uh, for different ranks or for different districts? I think it's very important because this is about scoring, a scoring exercise. I don't think this scoring exercise is invented by itself because this form is supposed to be a full in for the superiors to look at. So if this is not true, then you will need to remove, try to get rid of all copies of this form. Well, the student had uh, passed the um, documents to the director, but your time's up, Tanya. So, director, I hope that you can verify under your doc uh, department whether there is this um, assessment system for assistant local control officers and whether there is such a form used to do their appraisal. And please let us know afterwards the meeting if um, they do exist. So maybe I can ask the, our colleagues to take a picture of the documents. Well, you can take pictures of the documents and return them to us afterwards. Okay, next one. Starry Lee. Chairman, our topic today is on enforcement strategy relating to Hong Kong control. But let me tell the director, in the past, I've always complained to Deputy Director of FEHD about a common scenario, that is the public through complaining, because they find that it's not much use complaining to FEHD and they find that the streets are actually, despite the complaints, remain unclean, like what happened in this picture. Every time they lodge a complaint, still the same kind of a scene appear on the streets, like cardboard boxes or um, foam boxes continue to be littered, strewn on the street. And you said that uh, you have frontline staff um, asking, uh, you know, um, you, uh, indeed, you did add, but despite the complaints, the streets are uncleaned because people throw rubbish onto the street and earth and the pavement, and you can't take any action if the litters are on the road, not the pavement. I agree with Lam Kho Fan that for controversial um, incidents that have happened and sometimes they're worried that you take the action of tightening guidelines after an accident has happened. And I'm worried that when you tighten guidelines, that would really put pressure on frontline officers to take actions without much thinking. You need to be reasonable and be sensitive at the same time, considering, for example, the situation of a district or the persons involved in a case. Say whether it's an elderly person or whether, for example, hawker hawking activities are a characteristic of a um, district. And in other districts, you know, the presence of hawkers can be seen as a nuisance. So you can't just rely strictly on guidelines alone. You don't. You shouldn't really put the pressure or the burden on frontline staff, who should really communicate with the uh, supervisor when any uh, contro controversial incidents happen. So there needs to be communication between supervisors and frontline staff to rationalize various cases. So as Mr. Lau said, we need to pay attention to enforcement on street management and licensed hawkers. So I'd like to know. Say if there are items put on the road, thoroughfares, is it that you wouldn't take any action? Many shops have put their stuff on the street, causing obstruction. 
They even put stuff items on the street, resulting in lack of enforcement. So the hygiene condition or hygiene problem continues. And also, when it comes to appraisal, I agree that you shouldn't use the number of a summons to do your appraisal or, or assess staff performance. But the supervisor should consider whether um, officers have done a good job in street management or environmental hygiene. Well, can you ask them to give me a written reply because yeah, you you've, you've stopped your three minutes. Yes. Okay. Next one, Lao Siu Lai. In response to questions raised by other members, like whether the fall uh, guidelines are followed rigidly, that only those with license uh, will be spared. But in fact, even the licensed hawkers were sued. In the past few years, four thousand to six thousand licensed hawkers were sued for obstructing the street. I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about unfair. Um, administration of justice by FHG. They tend to the department tend to let the young hawkers off. More than a hundred hawkers who were all elderly men and women, who were actually caught. So FHG should issue verbal warning first to a suspended offender, right, before taking action. But for the elderly woman who uh, was sued for getting one dollar, I haven't seen. Your officers, your officers hadn't issued a verbal warning first. I've heard from some residents that uh, you tend you tend to bully the old women. So in the past, over the past three years, can you give me a breakdown of the distribution, age distribution of uh, hawkers sued, and also the number of verbal warnings issued? If you don't have the figures right now, please provide them to us in writing. Okay. Let me ask all the questions first. As for mobile network, well, on the streets, a lot of uh, operators, providers of operate uh, mobile networks, touting touting the services, and sometimes they set up because uh, people use credit cards, so you can't enforce the law. So in a way, you are actually condoning large companies, and yet, and letting them get off the hook, not being prosecuted, and yet you are targeting these small hookers. Director, first question on our law enforcement: whether we target elderly hawkers. From what I know, over the past of the um, number of law enforcement figures, if I were to draw a line, that is defining elderly people as those 65 or above, these people only make up a small amount of our convicted offenders, about 10 to 15 percent in total. Secondly. As for whether you know in law enforcement, whether we are favoring, okay, you haven't completed my. How about verbal warnings? Have you issued verbal warnings first before taking action? Have you penalized officers who did not issue verbal warnings and your number of verbal warnings? And the ten to fifteen percent were convictions. How about figure for prosecutions? So please give us the figures afterwards. And chairman. Ms. Lau asked about whether is it really that we always will warn before we take enforcement action? As I said at the outset, it depends on the circumstance. In general, at um, high pedestrian areas, high pedestrian flow areas, major thoroughfare. Well, when it comes to the case of the uh, old lady selling carbon boxes at one dollar, it is not a major thoroughfare, not an area of high pedestrian flow. Why did it happen? We are here to discuss about um, enforcement strategies. Some members cited specific cases. I would not. I would not talk about specific cases. Because we have already decided not to take in prosecution action. No, I'm not here to talk about a specific case. Well, frontline officers don't give warning first. Will the department correct them or penalize them? Please understand that uh, when enforcement action is taken, it you will have to consider the circumstance as well. 
There may be more than one hawker at the scene. Sometimes there may be more than one hawker. What can be done? Some of them look older. Some may look younger. If we are calcified, what are we supposed to do? I believe that the frontline officer will consider all factors before taking the most appropriate enforcement action. Well, please give、uh, written supplementary information for parts that you haven't answered, Mr. Roy Kwong. I was one of the members who asked for a discussion about enforcement strategy relating to hawker control. Because there are more and more controversies caused by law enforcement action of the FEHD, well, from、uh, most recent case, the one dollar old lady. Before that, there was、um, an old lady who was、uh, prosecuted because she poured water down the drain, and then there was another one before that when the hawker control team chased. A hawker and the hawker fell into the ditch and died. No nola and died. The director said that there was no quota. But can the director answer? Over the years, has there been some kind of chart? Because we've heard for over ten years that in the hawker control team there is a chart. The chart. Will set out information about、uh, about an individual of well the officers and the number of prosecutions they have done over the years. Has it ever happened, Director? I can't answer this question because I don't know how long that time period is. But I can tell you, the number of prosecutions every year, and I need a way to. Collect statistics because otherwise I will not know about the number of prosecutions. And you call this a chart. What do you mean by that? And if you ask if we have kept statistics, of course we have. Otherwise, I would not be able to tell you、uh, the number of prosecutions. Mr. Kwong. Mention about a number of incidents, and he asked whether there are problems in our enforcement. As I said, that、uh, well, we will review the、uh, guideline, and members said the guideline should not be calcified. Yes, we'll try to improve it. There are about two thousand people in the hawker control teams. And thousands of people responsible for cleaning. Without a guideline, it will be difficult. Director, I am very concerned whether there is any concealment from the、uh, senior echelon, because we heard about charts, we heard about quotas. So, well, there must be something. I hope that you would rectify the situation. Would you consider meeting the staff union in the near future? It's an important part of my duty to meet with the staff union, and I do that regularly. After、uh, the incidents, I have spoken to them, and the first message they said to me was that that they would.、Um, Carry out their duties. They will continue to carry out their duties conscientiously. And I asked if the guidelines were unclear, and they gave us, and they gave me some comments. Well, we're asked about the definition of、uh, repeated warnings. Does it mean warnings given in that morning or immediately before an enforcement action? It's difficult to ju judge. We would like to 
uh, respond to queries raised by staff members. There are a number of members who would like to speak, so we don't have we won't have a second round. And ma and I ask members to stick to the three minutes. Mr. Lang Yu Chong. Just now, the director said that in principle, uh, there will be a warning first. However, you qualify by saying that uh, you have to be flexible. You will have to take into account the situation before deciding on appropriate action. That means you haven't said anything. You said that you will warn first before taking an enforcement action, and then you qualify by saying that it depends on the situation, and then you will, dis and then the staff will decide um, the most appropriate action. So s staff members may say we have taken into consideration the situation. As a result, uh, we take enforcement action without giving warnings. So it got the, the letter part completely nullify what you said at the beginning. Well, when you hear uh, someone shouting that hawker control is here, they would not care. They the hawkers would simply scatter because they know that there won't be any prior warning given, and the hawker control team will chase them. Few blocks, they will not give up. And uh, the hawker control team officers will not uh, will not act alone because they are afraid of fight. So there will be a group of hawker control officers uh, against one hawker. Well, I'm. Sh sh you said that uh, you have not heard about any of these appraisals or quotas. You have given power to frontline officers and given power to um, their superiors. You said to them that, uh, well, the decision is based on the situation. So if you talk about flexibility and the situation uh, there and then, then how will the guideline help them, director? As I said, we face a great challenge. There are different views concerning hawker control. I heard from members that we have to deal with the guideline very carefully. We can't completely rely on it. And at the same time, some other members said without guidelines, we'll Officers be given a free reign. One time, I visited a, a district and uh, talked to frontline front officers, and we talked about uh, a task force to deal with uh, illegal extension of uh, eateries. They said to me that uh, our prosecution is just uh, so so, and I said prosecution number is unimportant. The most important thing is the uh, situation in the street was better than no prosecution case because there is no need. The streets are not obstructed. And I'd also like to say about uh, strategy. Mr. Long mentioned about um, unrelentlessly, unrelentlessly chasing hawkers. Our guideline states that we have to be mindful about safety, not just the officer themselves, but the hawker and members of the public. Do they have to chase? It depends on the situation. And the guideline says, when in doubt, don't give chase. There is no one guideline that can cater for every situation. But we have a large enforcement team. Without guidelines, it will be difficult for them to decide what to do when they take enforcement action. 
And I'd like to say that we have an academy, and we are a rare. It is rare for a non-disciplined service to have an academy. Frontline officers, when first recruited, will go through a two-month training. After that, after they have learned about procedures and the law, they would be posted to carry out their duties. Sorry, I can't uh, let you continue to speak. I'm sure members are, con are happy to know about training and also frontline gui guidelines given to frontline officers, perhaps, so you can give us the information. I have received from Mr. Jeremy Tam and Ms. Tanya Chen two motions. Ones related to the item under discussion, I have given instructions to the Secretariat to have it copied. The other one says this panel asked the FEHD to provide appraisal forms currently used to assess. Um, staff members of uh, various ranks. And this is not a motion. I'm sh Well, the panel can ask the FEHD to give us the information. I believe the department will not turn us down. So please, give us appraisal forms. We don't have to put it to a vote. When we finish with the question, we will deal with the motion. Ms. Claudia Mo. Thank you. The fact is that the impression given by the department is that frontline officers pick on the weak and the old. You can blame the media, you can blame the online media for exaggerating. But I think the crust of the problem is that there is a, an utter lack of common sense that is unacceptable. You said uh, Old people account for about 10 to 15 percent of prosecutions. It's not prosecution, it's conviction rate. Perhaps it's because of the compassion of uh, the judiciary that most of the old people are not convicted. Director, you may want to protect your staff. But I'm concerned that is because you are too far away. You said there are internal guidelines, I know, but are they abide by? There may be some supervisors who uh, think they who think above their stations that they will ask for quotas to be met. Frontline officers are caught in a between a hard be, between a rock and a hard place. The letter from the staff union makes it clear that um, supervisors put pressure on frontline officers, and it says that um, there is a mentality of um, interest-driven. There is an interest-driven mentality amongst uh, the management. I think there is a serious problem with the management and their mentality. Would you promise that you would clear up the management and rectify the situation? Give us that promise, Director. I have heard a lot of views, and I will deal with them positively. I will look into the situation members have outlined, and where there is room for improvement, uh, I will definitely do something. The one dollar old lady, 
I heard that the enforcement officer pointed at the old lady that uh, that is done according to the law. Even a dollar is uh, illegal hawking. Well, if I stand up all of a sudden, would I be evicted? Would I um, would I be accused of obstructing the meeting? Well, you talk about uh, ru ruling by the law. There is a piece of draconian uh, law, then you rule by it. But in Hong Kong, we have rule of law. Uh, okay, so now, paragraph 12 in the paper, FEHD will review the current operational guidelines. And just then we asked you for the current guidelines, including uh, staff assessment forms, criteria, and so forth. So I'd like to ask, Director, what plans do you have to conduct the review? Chairman, okay, after the recent incidents, we internally have discussed, we will discuss with the unions, and we also talked to frontline <coughs> staff, as I just said. We are going to review um, in the direction of better interpretations of key terms, because uh, some members have asked about what it means to be um, someone not amenable to repeated advice. And they've given us some um, examples of actual scenarios. So we'll also look at, in the process of evidence collection, how can we collect evidence at the spot, particularly in relation to hawkers selling their items on the street. How can we find adequate evidence for prosecution? We also look at priority of prosecution. Our law enforcement strategies. Our strategies are never hidden from public on our website. It's listed. That is, at certain locations, we would adopt a strategy of not issuing warning before enforcement actions are taken. We list out the names of the locations. We try to be clear, make it clear to the public where you know unlicensed talking activities are banned, and people will be arrested without warning. Yes, all this information are on our website. There are two types. One is the black spots for unlicensed hawkers, and the other are main thoroughfares and um, pavements busy with people. Of course, we will, depending on public opinions, district council opinions, update the list. But we, sorry, director, but if um, you know, for people over the age of sixty-five who may not go online to your website to find out what where are the black spots and where they could be arrested without warning. So maybe frontline staff of your department, when they meet the elderly hawkers, they need to tell them to stay away from the locations. Yeah, for disabled or elderly people, we will try to be compassionate towards them. So as far as we can, we will try to issue uh, verbal warnings in place of prosecution. But if um, verbal warnings and also um, actions trying to get people away from the street do not work, then we need to take action to maintain hygiene and order there. Next one, Long Kong Chairman, well, we're talking about facts today. That is, for example, the um, quota for prosecutions stated by staff unions. The director said, what do you mean by this uh, chart of um, chart, top charts for prosecutions? But the unionists are accusing you of imposing a prosecution quota on them, no matter what. And secondly, in terms of promotion and appraisal of staff, you do use the scores based on prosecutions as a criterion, key criterion. I think, Director, you need to properly address these accusations. They are strong accusations. You can't just be try to be vague and or dismiss them. 
And for the information, we asked you for. Chairman said you would definitely give them to us. I'm not sure. I don't think you give us your internal guidelines or all your materials in your training class. Your strategy for prosecution. You said that well, people can find the black spots online. Are you telling us that people can know everything on the website? That you have no no other information hidden, Chairman? Did you mean that people can get everything they need to know, all the location, uh, locations where there would not be any warnings, prior warnings? Is that all people can get online, or do you have a separate menu as well, Director? So we were talking about black spots. For hawkers, or as I said, main thoroughfares, busy pavements. Indeed, on our website, people can find what uh, where they are that we are targeting. But the elderly women, or the women who pour the water, they are not actually what happened to them are not covered in your website examples. So you're trying to get away with it. You said that uh, it depends on the situation whether you take enforcement action. But you had logical thinking training. Whether you want to prosecute or not, whether it, even though it deserves to be prosecuted, there are two different things. If it's not in a black spot, if it's not in a busy area, and if it's not co related to cooked food, and then you will only prosecute after prior warnings. So if that's the case, the, the old woman should have got away with what she uh, with her case. But then it is so. After all, it shows that it is after all a question of law enforcement. How can you be giving us a a, a, a sim so trivial in your response to our questions? You are obliged to give us a proper answer. Sorry, she doesn't have time to answer anyway. Her time is out. Ted Hoy. Well, I'm not trying to speak, but I want to ask you about the next item, because that would require ten minutes about the sector. So once I step out, and you would say I wouldn't have a chance to ask questions. So I have another meeting at four thirty. Well, I think those in the queue for this item, you also have also to deal with a motion. So yeah, I know. So please don't interrupt. So please tell us, are you going to discuss the agenda item five? Because I we need to know the time. Tell me, Jerome, this meeting won't end till five. Yeah, but for your next item, it is supposed to have fifty minutes, and yet you're not finished with this current item, and you do you need to deal with a motion yet. As well, so should I stay here to wait? I need to go to another meeting next door, and four thirty. There's another panel meeting scheduled. Mr. Chairman, if you keep talking like this, we won't have enough time. Next one, please, in the queue, Ted Hoy. You're not acting properly as uh, chairman. Please switch off Tommy Jones' mic. You're not acting properly as a chairman. If you continue to shout from your seat, I will have to ask the steward to take you out of this room. Ted Hoy, please. In the paper, and uh, given what the administration said, the general policy is um, for warning to be issued first before law enforcement action is taken. And if um, the hawk concern ignores the repeated advice, then um, you would take action. But the government, please think about your general principle. Even in in whether the general principle is applicable in the real situation, like the elderly woman who is selling or holding some cardboard boxes, if she is not really causing obstruction or affecting environmental hygiene or undermining business of nearby shops, so what's the point of warning her? Are you just asking her to um, put away the cardboard boxes? But if you if you ask her to put away the boxes, she may not listen. So I think your guideline may not be applicable in her case. So if you say that you warn first and then take law enforcement, that's just um, an excuse. I think what usually happens is your staff, frontline staff, tend to target the old and the weak because they're less educated and they don't know how to 
resist, and that's why you just choose the soft targets first. And those who would、uh, talk back or call the police would be given a more lenient treatment. I think that's what we tend to see in reality. So back to your guidelines. I think the guidelines should be made clear that if someone is not obstructing the use of a road, not、uh, undermining environmental hygiene, if the hawker concern is not affecting the business of nearby shops, causing unfairness in trade, then. There's no need for any law enforcement action. You need to make your guidelines more concrete. Could you, perhaps, you know, incorporate these concrete wordings in your guidelines, Director? As I said in the beginning, I mentioned that based on existing laws, the, the current law really says that unless the law hawker concern has a license. No one should be selling goods on the street. So legally speaking, there's no distinction between who, under what circumstances, would be exempted from being prosecuted. So please understand, we are trying to, you know,、um, enforce the same principle in the guidelines to respect the spirit of the rule of law, given what is said in the law. But I understand that the hawkers' issue. It's so controversial, and it actually involves relatively minor offences. How can we be reasonable and sensitive at the same time? We know the grounds, and we know the hawker's、uh, reasons, and it's a big challenge. You know how to deal with various situations. And Mr. Hu is saying that under circum certain circumstances, we should or need not take law enforcement. But to, to us, it's difficult for us not to take enforcement action. Okay. Well, I think time is almost up. Next one is Chen Chi Chen. Thank you, Chairman. Today, if you want to see a doctor, you need to first of all expect a doctor to give you a diagnosis. First, if the doctor doesn't do any diagnosis and just say that there is room for improvement. Then it's difficult for us to know whether you will strive to make improvements. So we're saying today that the hawker control officers、um, actually may have problems in the way they enforce the law. Would you admit that? You know whether they don't listen to the actual、um, instructions or whether the guidelines are not working. You need to let the public know whether there are any problems. So we've now put before us motion banning any. Um, imposition of quota within the government, but if you say that there's no quota, then there's no need for us to ban it. So if there's one such quota, then how do we stop that? You have to let us know whether it would really happen in the future or not. How would you respond to our concerns? And also, honestly. You know, people for the same for the policemen. They tend to target the weak. They tend to go for an easy way out. So sometimes, if the hawkers do not cooperate, you will call in the police. So you will catch ones that runs slow,、uh, that are weak, that are old, or even disabled. So do you have to maybe enhance your training so that they don't have to pick on the weak? And is it often that you have to call for assistance from the police? Because you give the impression that、uh, you target the you pick easy targets, those that are weak. Members talk about、uh, an impression that we only. Pick、uh, elderly people to prosecute. I said that、uh, the percentage was ten to fifteen percent. That's、um, prosecution number. I have the prosecution number of twenty sixteen age group. On illegal hawking prosecution numbers, about four thousand. Those above the age of sixty accounts for less than five hundred. That is four hundred and seventy-eight. I understand your concern, but if you look at the figures, 
is not the case that we target a particular age group. You may not have a policy, but would you review whether there is this situation? Well, according to our guideline for the aged and the disabled, if they engage in hooking, then we would uh, try to be as understanding as possible. Just let me uh, say one more thing. Staff Union expressed some comments. I am the head of a department. I have the responsibility to address the issues raised, to find out whether there is any possible misunderstanding, and I will do my duty to explain to them. Yes, uh, the director has made it clear that uh, she will follow up with the views expressed by the, st by the staff union. Mr. Stephen Ho is the last one to speak. I also received from him amendment to Mr. Jeremy Tam and Ms. Tanya Chan's motion. Maybe you need to um, explain as well, explain your amendment. Um, Madam Chair, I ask uh, for the next item uh, to be postponed to the next time, otherwise it will affect the quality of our discussion. If members uh, don't overrun, if they don't ask for extra time to finish their sentence, then I would be able to deal with it uh, more well better. Please speak on your amendment. It's just a suggestion. I'm using my own time anyway. I received from Mr. Tam a motion. It mentioned about uh, quotas and uh, staff members being pushed to meet quotas. If we vote for this, of course, uh, you can say that uh, it may prevent or stop it. But it's on the basis that the administration is actually doing this. So I would like to amend that uh, if you have looked into it and found that to be true, then it should be stopped. And I heard from other members talking about discretion, whether guidelines are restricting or whether they are sufficient. Well, if there is uncontrolled hawking, then it will affect um, the environment. And if you don't allow that, it will affect people's livelihood. Just now, Miss Starry Lee mentioned about FEHD officers, coach, illegal shops, or hawkers to just dis to leave abandoned items on the road so that hawker control teams don't have to deal with that, or FEHD don't doesn't have to deal with it. I ask the director to look into it. There is also one I uh, well there are also incidents being repeated all the time uh, the uh, old granny selling carton at one dollar um, chasing relentlessly hawkers forcing them to jump into a, a, a nola well I've learned the information from the media so I ask director to cons to look into it to see if to look into the m mental condition of the officers to um to see whether uh, they needed to chase give chase to hawkers and a number of other factors I can't stop members from speaking at the beginning. Members would like to get more information from government officials. That's why for members who first spoke, they used more time. So did the official. Now we have a motion and an amended motion to deal with. Mr. Stephen Ho, please present your amendment. 
is amendment to Mr. Tanya Chen and Mr. Jeremy Tam's motion. This panel is of the view that um, if there is any practice of uh, quotas or pushing for numbers in the FEHD, it should be prohibited and uh, there should be prohibition to uh, use the number of seizure, arrests, and um, summonses to assess performance of staff members. So this is textual, right? Mr. Jeremy Tam and Ms. Chan, do you agree to the textual amendment? We need a quorum if we are to put it to a vote. We still need three more members. Please ring the bell. We still need two more. Once we have a quorum, we'll put it to a vote. The bell is being rung. I ask the members of this panel to come back. We still need one. This is uh, to vote on Mr. Stephen Ho's amendment to the motion of Mr. Jeremy Tam and Ms. Tanya Chan. Members, those who are in favor, please raise their hands. This is Mr. Ho's amendment. Please don't do anything when it, when a vote is being cast. Please, for those in favor, please raise their hands once again. Thirteen for. Those against, please raise their hands. Those abstain. This amended motion is endorsed. I thank the FEHD. Now we move on to the next item. We can start the discussion because this meeting lasts till 5 o'clock. If we don't have time, enough time, then we'll decide whether to continue next time. Please ask government representatives to come in. We need to deal with issuance of licenses, review of fees and improvement measures. There is an information paper here. We will try to compress the time and go straight into question and answer. Do you agree? No. So you want to hear from the official. But there needs to be two meetings. Even if you compress time, say you give us three instead of four minutes. When we come back, do you give members three minutes? This is not good. I would like to hear from the official. Mr. Ho would like to hear from the uh, official. I ask them to quickly present the paper. Thank you. I would like to present to you the um, the update. That is uh, a review of fees in the 2013-14 budget commitment. In 1998, because of the economic situation, the ex-regional council and ex 
Ex-urban council reduced fees by 30%, and ex-regional council froze the fees. And in 2013, an exercise was completed to align difference in fees, adopting the lower level. So apart from the 2013 downward adjustment in the past 19 years, there, is, there hasn't been much change to licensing fees. We have always adopted the principle of uh, cost recovery and user pay principle. Recently, we have conducted a calculation of cost, and we found that uh, the overall cost of um, liquor license services is subsidized about 24 million per annum by taxpayers because the cost recovery rate is about 38 percent only. We would like to rationalize the fee structure to re better reflect relative costs. On this basis, we would like to adjust the fees level to recover the overall cost based on the user pays principle. When it comes to issuance of license, some services in entail more complicated work and different services, say new issuance or renewal. However, the current fees are the same, and the fees level does not reflect workload. So we propose to rationalize the entire fee structure. When it comes to Issuance of license and renewal currently the fees are the same when but however when it comes to new issuance uh, there is more work involved. So we will rationalize uh, the fees level. For a renewal of license for one year, it will be about thirty percent of a new issue. And you'll find uh, information more information in Annex A. In paragraph 7, you'll find information about the uh, revision. At 2017-18 price level, the fees levels are set out in the table. There has not been any revision for about two decades. If we recover cost in one go, the impact is quite significant. And if we need to implement mitigation measures to allay the impact to the trade, we may adopt um, a gradual increase to the cost recovery level. We give the justification and the policy direction in the paper. We would like to hear comments from members. After that, we will go back to further consider the situation before we decide on the fee revision proposal for public consultation in September. In NXP, we have given some examples of different scenarios, say a two-year scenario, is for members' reference to facilitate discussion. As I said, we will improve the proposal after hearing from members. In September or October, we will have uh, pu we will have public consultation on stakeholders. We will consult the liquor licensing board. Um, Food Business and Related Trade Task Force, Task Force on Business Liaison Groups, Recreational Clubs, Business Liaison Group, and Hotels, a Business Liaison Group under the Economic Analysis and Business Facilitation Unit of the Financial Secretary's Office. And in order to improve uh, efficiency and reduce cost and to facilitate business, uh, we have put in place a number of um, measures to streamline 
procedures. Say, for example, renewal uh, can be extended by a maximum validity period of two years instead of one to reduce operation cost. Indeed, we've also launched a system, backup system, allowing the um, license C to be replaced by somebody else in case of emergency. And the time for applying for a license actually has been extended from two to three months to three to four months. In January, the FHD police and the um, Food and Health Bureau have launched a working group to implement the various measures. NSC, you can find details. In the days ahead, we will further study various measures to try to optimize the operation of the uh, liquor licensing application system to make it um, to try to facilitate facilitate business endeavors more. So we would like to um, take on board and listen to members' views. Thank you. So I think the government now is um, involved in various um, plans. In the summer, you will consult the trade. In September, I'm sure October, you will come back to this panel to consult members, I'm sure. Yes, um, yes, we want to have a formal public consultation with the sector in September and October. And after that, when we have a firmer stance, then we will hopefully by the end of this year, we will have a legislative proposal for discussion in Let's Go. So, okay, today you're hearing uh, members' views. Okay, so members have raised their hands, include Tommy Chen, Kuka Ki, Jeremy Tam, Jack Hoi, and Tanya Chen. But as you know, this meeting, well, has to be ended at five. So I believe um, each member or three members will have a chance to speak. Each have three minutes. Tommy Chung, Kwa Ki, and Jeremy Tam. For the others, I think you have to wait till we come back in September to follow up on this matter again then. Tommy Chung, please. Chairman, just then you said that there will be a consultation. Various groups will be consulted. I have no views on that. But I want to ask you to confirm that after the sector has been consulted, the stakeholders have expressed their views, what what happened? Short answer, please. Mr. Wong. Yes, thank you. We would uh, look at the government's cost recovery and user pay policies and principles, and then we will consider the impact on the sector where there could be good mitigation measures before drawing up a legislative proposal. And we'll come back to this panel for feedback. So please be clear. Don't just say that, give people the impression that you consult the sector and that you would actually have to go there with a stick, forcing them to accept your plans. Chairman, look at the chart from $3,000 to to be increased to more than 10000 17000 the new CE had just taken office. You said that the government is rich and there's a lot we can do. So why are you robbing from my sector? And also for license renewal, even though the increase isn't bad, isn't that high, but when it comes to license transfer, because um, well, the liquor license holder can only hold one license and it has to be one individual, not a company. But it's very common for liquor licenses to be transferred. And every time they transfer license, they have to um, be charged $10,000. So you're saying that staff members who are taking over a license can be charged. So I think that you haven't really thought through your plan carefully. You are just trying to recover the cost. Of course, I know well, the civil servants, of course, involved are high, and you may involve police officers to help. You're not paying the police officers, of course, but the officers will be asked to do investigation, to check for license, and so forth. And you are charging the sector for that. Like licensing board, in the past, for many years, I have appointed to a number of issues. 
the Lake Lassen Sing Board. In August, it has a summer recess, whole month of summer recess, and I don't know during that period, or how many restaurants, eateries, because of that, are forced to close their business for one year, except the council only rest for two weeks. So how come the Lake Lassen Sing Board go for a goes for a one month long summer recess? Even when the executive council go on summer recess, Hong Kong still um, run as usual. But if the Lake Licensing Board is not meeting, then there's nothing we can do to process license applications. So how can our sector support your intention to increase fees? Okay, we've got two more members with questions. I'd like to ask members because the administration said that in September, October, they will carry out public consultation. If members agree, we can, in September, call a public hearing to do the consultation in parallel with the government to listen to the stakeholders and public views. Do you support that? That is, we have the public hearing in September so that the members who don't have a chance to ask questions now can listen more carefully then. Would you agree that we have a public hearing in September? I won't object to that. But in September, I won't be in Hong Kong early in September. As um, trade representative, I would prefer a date that suits my schedule. You shouldn't have the hearing when I'm away from Hong Kong. You can rest assured, Tommy Zhang. Just as Ho Chun Yin said, I think it'll be better if we have seen the consultation paper i don't know i don't know when the government will have the consultation paper ready maybe we can wait till the paper is ready maybe the secretary can liaise with the administration see whether it should be in september or october we're trying to accommodate member schedules i'll see whether it's necessary for it to be done in september if you um put it off for one month or half a month we have time to read the paper. Members are just worried that if everything is been de has been decided they'll be too late to have the hearing. Well it, 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 well it, it, I may just join the consultation but we could have finished our discussion today actually. DS before you have the public consultation, before you um finalize the consultation paper, would you be able to show it to members and have a public hearing? Thank you, Chairman. We need to, as I said, we need to um, meet with the stakeholders first. Then we can give Let's Go the paper and find out the latest. I'm here today to listen to members' views. So once we have heard your views, then we can actually um, have better um, considerations in preparing our paper. Okay, key. Chairman, there are two types of liquor license. One is for general restaurants. We understand that restaurants do need a license. We have received the largest number of complaints against bars, particularly in residential areas. I'm worried that you say that you know, the application exercise will be done every two years. Then for, say, bars, restaurants that have caused much nuisance to neighbors or even operations that have fire safety hazards, then the two-year period will actually encourage them despite residents' complaints. And they will fail to comply with licensing conditions. So I'm just worried that it will continue to um, increase nuisances to nearby residents. You know, in some non traditional areas like in Prince Edward or even Western District, where there are more bars now, whole blocks of commercial buildings have sprung up there and they have created much impact on residents. And there are also um, street shops that have post nuisance to residents above. You are saying that you want to reduce the cost, but we're talking about impact nuisance to residents. So would you really address the residents' concerns? And I, 
I am not against um, cost recovery. So, but why is the government using two years, adopting the two-year period approach? Is the government hoping to subsidize bar owners? If, even though they are causing nuisance to people, you're still trying to. Is the government's policy to continue to support them? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Kwok. Policy wise, we've always had to balance interests. On the one hand, to facilitate business, and at the same time, we don't want to cause nuisances to people. Therefore, we have the liquor licensing board that vet license applications. And to facilitate business, we allow them to have the licenses in place for two years. Our focus is that for someone who wants to get a two year license, the person, the applicant, will be required to have two years of good track record prior to application. Otherwise, they wouldn't be issued a two year license. In Appendix A of the paper, Annex A, it lists out. That we've got uh, more than four thousand license renewal applications since the new policy, and for some applications, we only gave them a one-year license, and that shows that the Lake licensing board is playing a gatekeeper role. And our policy also is to the financial situation or the policy of the government is to recover costs, but our fees sometimes. Um, there have been two big differences, too much gaps between fees, levels of fees. So therefore, we need to have the consultation to try to align them. Shu Kafa, you the last one. One minute. We need to hand over this room to the next party. I just want to ask the government: How many types of licenses do you have right now, and that they do recover the cost? Do you have a breakdown? How many types of licenses that? Have recovered the cost. I'm not talking about liquor licenses, all sorts of licenses, because you're talking about the cost recovery principle, right, for licenses. So, how many licenses issued have recovered the cost? Do you have a breakdown? Well, that would be a very broad question because there are all sorts of licenses. Chairman, what I'm trying to say is that the item is on, you know, in increased license fees. In the tourism industry, for more than twenty months, the operating environment hasn't been good. It has been bad indeed because the costs and everything, labor costs are high, and yet the Hong Kong government has lots of reserves. And you're saying that because of your cost recovery principle, you want to raise the license fees. But how many licenses, types of licenses, are in Hong Kong, and how many of them have you managed to recover the cost? You can give me the answer in writing. I think policy-wise and in actual practice, whatever you want to tell us, you can let us know. Yet yeah, this involves uh, different bureaus, different types of operations. I will have to uh, raise the issue, discuss it with the um, Treasury Bureau. We don't have time to have a proper, comprehensive discussion on this item. The panel then agreed to find a time with the administration. The secretary will liaise with the administration to, between September and October, find a suitable time slot to call a public hearing to listen to uh, the views of the stakeholders and the sector. It will also give more opportunity for members to exchange views with the administration. This is the last meeting of this legislative year. I thank members. I thank the secretariat for supporting our work. Meeting agenda.